Great. Hi, I'm Jeff Brown. I'm here with, uh, with Richard Schwartz. I'm just going to read your, uh, your bio, Dick, to begin right. with. Richard Schwartz began his career as a systemic family therapist and an academic. He co-authored with Michael Nichols, Family Therapy, Concepts and Methods, the most widely used family therapy text in the U.S. Dr. Schwartz was associate professor in the Department of, Psychiat of Psychiatry at the University of Illinois at Chicago's Institute for Juvenile Research and later at the Family Institute at Northwestern University. In 2014, he moved from the Chicago area to Boston and now is on the faculty of the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He is also a senior fellow of the Meadows Treatment Center in Arizona. Grounded in systems thinking, Dr. Schwartz developed Internal Family Systems, IFS, in response to clients' descriptions of various parts within themselves. He focused on the relationships among these parts and noticed that there were systemic patterns to the way they were organized across clients. He also found that when, when the client's parts felt safe and were allowed to relax, the clients would experience spontaneously the qualities of confidence, openness, and compassion that Dr. Schwartz came to call the self. He found that when in that state of self, clients would know how to heal their parts. IFS is now evidence-based and has become a widely used form of psychotherapy, particularly with trauma. It provides a non-pathologizing, optimistic, and empowering perspective and a practical and effective set of techniques. This approach to psychotherapy suggested alternative ways of understanding psychic functioning and healing and lent itself to innovative techniques for relieving clients' suffering and symptoms. IFS is a non-pathologizing, hopeful framework within which to practice psychotherapy. IFS has also moved beyond psychotherapy and is being used in innovative ways in the fields of mediation, conflict resolution, education, spirituality, executive and health coaching, and medicine. A featured speaker for many national professional organizations, Dr. Schwartz has published many books and over 50 articles about IFS. His books include You Are the One You've Been Waiting For, Bringing Conscious Love to Intimate Relationships, Internal Family Systems Therapy, Introduction to the Internal Family Systems Model, and The Mosaic Mind, Empowering the Tormented Selves of Child Abuse Survivors with Regina Goulding, as well as Meta Frameworks with Doug Brunlin and Betty Carrer about transcending current models of family therapy. There is also vast IFS literatures written by others. A bibliography and information about trainings and other resources can be found on the website www.selfleadership.org. In 2000, Richard Schwartz founded the Center for Self-Leadership in Oak Park, Illinois. CSL offers three levels of training in IFS, workshops for professionals and for the general public, an annual national conference, publications and DVDs of Dr. Schwartz's work through its website at selfleadership.org. IFS trainings and workshops are now held around the world. Wow. Good to meet you, Dick. <laughs> you too, Greg. It's good. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a real treat to meet you. I uh, just got to know you through your writing very recently and stumbled yeah. onto your book in a bookstore, Grounded Spirituality, and uh, just felt like I found a kindred spirit. So it was very exciting for me. Um, before we get into sort of the alignment between perspectives, um, mm -hmm. maybe just if you're open to it, just give us some idea of how you came to this notion of IFS and, and what it really means as a framework. Sure. Um, we'll go back. Now it's about 36 years, I think. And I was uh, fresh out of graduate school. I got a PhD in marital and family therapy. Back in the day when there was a big rift between individual therapists and family therapists, and we family therapists thought we were the cool guys because we, we could change everything about a person's internal world by just changing these external relationships. Mm -hmm. And people that were mucking around in the intrapsychic world were wasting their time because we could do that. And so I went to try to prove that while I was at that University of Illinois at Chicago and gathered together 30 bulimic kids and their families and reorganized the families just the way the book said to. And uh, my 
at least some of my patients didn't realize they'd been cured and they kept binging and purging. And mm -hmm. so out of frustration, I started asking why. And they, they basically started teaching this to me because they mm -hmm. talked about these different parts. And they would say things like, when something bad happened in my life, it would trigger this critic who then could make me feel horrible. And that would bring up a part that felt lonely and empty and alone and young and worthless. And that feeling was so dreadful that to get me away from it would come the binge and would take me out of my body and make me an unfeeling eating machine. But the act of the binge would bring the critic back who's now calling me a pig on top of the other names. Right. And of course that would bring back that empty, lonely, uh, worthless part who then needed the binge again. And so they would be in right. this kind of circular, vicious cycle that sounded familiar to me as a family therapist. It sounded like a internal pattern of relationships, right. like the families that I'd been working with. So I, I got very curious. At first, I, I got a little freaked out because it seemed like maybe they were crazier than I thought. You know, maybe they had multiple personality disorder because they were describing these parts as having a lot of autonomy and make them do things they didn't want to. And then I noticed inside myself, I've got them too. And some of mine are as extreme as my clients around food. So then I calmed down and I, I got curious and I began uh, exploring maybe using some family therapy technique even to change this. And because I was assuming that they were what they seemed to be, like the critic was just a bundle of uh, critical parental energy, which is what the field assumed, you know, some kind of- Like, like internalized self-hatred or something. Exactly, yeah. Right, that, right. That that's all it was. And the binge was some kind of out of control impulse. Mm. So I began, trying to get my client to stand up to the critic for herself and to control the binge. And of course that made it much worse, but I didn't know what else to do. I was like the man in a hole with a shovel. So I'd say, dig deeper, you know, stand up stronger, control more. Until the first client I was aware of that had this extensive sex abuse history and cut herself on her wrist and insisted on showing me the open wounds every session. And by then I learned the Gestalt empty chair technique, which I'm sure you know about where you would have an empty chair where the client pretended that was a part of them. Okay. And they would have a dialogue with that part and then they could be the part, sit in that chair and talk back. And I was doing some of that at the time. And so I was having my client do that with this cutting part. And one session we decided I wasn't gonna let her leave my office until the part agreed not to cut her that week. And of course, after a couple hours of badgering the part, it finally agreed not to. And then the next session, I opened the door and she's got a big gash down the side of her face. Mm. And that was a turning point in the history of this because I just kind of collapsed inside and spontaneously just said, I, I give up, I can't beat you at this. And the part shifted and said, I don't really want to beat you. And I got curious instead of coercive <clears throat> and said, then why do you do this to her? And the part talked about how when she was being abused, it had to keep her out of her body so she didn't feel it and contain the rage that would get her more abuse. And so I shifted again. Now I'm not just curious, but I have an abiding kind of appreciation for the heroic role it played in her life. And I can convey that to her and have my client convey that to the part. And it burst into tears because everybody had been trying to get rid of it and demonize it. And talked more about how it still protected other parts that were very vulnerable. And, you know, there was still danger in the world. And, and, but as it talked about all that, it sounded like it wasn't living in the present, like it was still frozen in those abuse scenes in the past. The power of then. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I like that phrase. <clears throat> and that uh, it thought the world was as dangerous as it was back then. And it, it thought she was still five years old. And so as I got all that, uh, it, it occurred to me that rather than fight these parts, the way to do it would be to love them and that they aren't what they seem, that they're 
these little inner children by and large who get promoted into these roles uh, by the traumas that happen to them. They're how the organism survives. I exactly. Think. Yeah, well, they, my position is they're more than that, that they're actually the nature of the mind is to be subdivided this way. It's natural to have multiple personalities. So we're born with uh, them either dormant and, or manifest, and then they kind of come online as we, as we grow up. Uh -huh. And all of them contain these extremely valuable qualities that are here to help us thrive. Uh -huh. But then they're forced out of their naturally valuable roles by these kinds of traumas into roles that can be quite damaging. So, so, so in other words, if I understand you correctly, somebody who, say, grew up without needing to develop mechanisms to manage trauma and overwhelm and adapt would still be sort of polyphrenic or multi-aspected, but those aspects wouldn't have, let's say, a shadowy nature um, and would be moving from their healthier, more organic, intrinsic quality or something. Exactly, yeah. Ah, got it, right. They wouldn't, Makes they, sense. Wouldn't, they wouldn't carry what we call burdens. And, and, and there would be a seamlessness in the way of relating to other parts and what you would call the core self, for example. Exactly. Yeah, they would be very harmonious with each other, and they would trust what I'm calling the self. Yeah, got to it. Lead. And so traumas and uh, attachment injuries disrupt what you just described and force, just like kids in a family. I mean, this is where the internal family system parallel comes. So if you've got a kid and the family gets traumatized and the parents don't protect the family, the kid steps up and becomes a parentified child mm -hmm. and is forced into this extreme role. Right. It isn't the nature of the kid, it's the role he was forced into. Of course. Right. So I'm seeing that the same, that these parts are just wonderfully valuable, but are forced into roles they're not equipped to handle right. by the traumas and attachment injuries. And they thereafter carry what I'm going to call burdens Mm -hmm. which are extreme beliefs and emotions that came into you during those times and attached to them almost like a virus mm -hmm. and thereafter like a programming and thereafter drive the way they operate. Mm -hmm. So healing becomes unburdening, helping these parts trust it's safe to release those extreme beliefs and emotions. Mm -hmm. And our field has made the mistake in spirituality also has made the mistake of assuming the parts are the burdens they carry. Absolutely. And, dis and as a result, disparaging story, disparaging localized self, disparaging ego, disparaging all of these things that connect to that which is uncomfortable and unresolved in the human experience and looking for the true self in some absolute anonymous kind of generic field of selfhood, which is primarily a, a bypass that's masquerading as some form of enlightenment or something. Exactly. And that's what I loved about reading your book because you were putting into words a lot of the things I was feeling. I'm not, I'm not in the spiritual world in the way you are. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't come necessarily from that background, but as I've been dabbling the last 10 years or so, all of these concerns about bypassing and exiling more and so on, mm -hmm have been coming to me and then I read your book and oh my God, you, it's all laid out. So. so let me, if I could, I want to read you something from Grounded Spirituality and I want to read something you've said. Maybe we could just talk, use it as a talking point. Great. Yeah. Um, so I should just show the book. Um, so in the heart of the matter chapter in the dialogues with Michael, uh, I say bottom line is that you cannot heal and resolve your emotional material with your mind. Knowing our issues is not the same as healing our issues. Your emotional material does not evaporate because you watch it. I have known many who could watch and name their patterns and issues as if they were scientists researching their own consciousness, but nothing fundamentally changed because they refused to come back down into their bodies and move their feelings through to transformation. It's safe up there, above the fray, witnessing the heartache without actually engaging it. Yes, you may be able to get so skilled at a witnessing consciousness that you can overpower your triggers, but that's not presence. Real presence comes through the open heart. The key to the transformation of challenging patterns and wounds is to heal them from the inside out, not to analyze them, not to watch them like an astronomer staring at a faraway planet through a telescope, but to jump right into the heart of them 
encouraging their expression and release, stitching them into new possibilities with the thread of love. Mm -hmm. You want to live a holy life, heal your heart. That's the best meditation of all, close quote. So on your, your uh, selfleadership.org site, mm -hmm. you have this amazingly helpful intro video. And so you said this, um, just to remind you, um, mm -hmm. this is a model of transformation. You're talking about IFS. It's not a model where the goal is to separate mindfully like mindfulness mm -hmm. is from thoughts and emotions and just observe them and not be a flood with them. The goal instead is to do that separation, enter the state we call self, and then go in a loving way and interact in a healing way. And that turns out to actually transform symptoms that had previously plagued people. So it's not accepting what is, it's actually healing it. So you don't actually get triggered in the same way anymore, close quote. So I feel like we're saying kind of the same thing. Exactly um, the same thing, a little bit different language. I mean, I, I don't imagine you're discrediting the value of mindfulness as a sort of a tool for looking at that which you need to go into, but not a healthy thing if you're looking at it thinking that's the end of the story and now you're going to go off somewhere else. Exactly. What I'll say is mindfulness is a good first step. Mm -hmm. So the separating from thoughts and emotions, in my language, separating from these parts and their extremes, mm -hmm. does allow you to observe them, but also allows you, just the simple act of separating accesses some degree of what I call self which is why people feel a lot better when they do separate. Yeah, they get, a, they get a break, relief or something. Exactly. Right. But if you think of these as ephemeral thoughts and emotions, which is what most of spirituality thinks of them as, mm -hmm. then it makes sense to separate and just witness them or watch them dissolve or whatever they because say. Because they're not the real deal. Exactly. They're, right, not, right. they're just ephemeral. Yeah. If instead you think of them as suffering inner beings, it makes no sense to simply watch them from a place of remove because mm -hmm. that's not compassion. Compassion means to go to suffering entities and embrace them and love them and help them heal. And integrate them. I mean, it's like when Tolle calls it the pain body, I always had a reaction to it. It was like talking about a car part. And yeah. so I call it my tender woundedness. So I think yeah. that's the distinction exactly. right there. Right. Exactly. And I, <laughs> I've always had this issue with him. And so many people are wild about them, and I just can't stand it because it drives me crazy. Well, because it's a lot of self-avoidance masquerading as enlightenment, right? Exactly. It all, you know, he, he does do a good job of talking about self. I'll give him that. Mm. But uh, he is so denigrating of the ego as a parasite or, you know, just he's got all these words for it. Right. So I'm a kind of crusader for the personhood of parts. Yeah, you're, so, honor, you're honoring our humanness is what I'm you're trying, doing. I'm trying, yeah. You, well, that's what you're doing, right? Yeah. Absolutely. You're yeah. saying, listen, the self is beautiful. We just got to get reintegrated. We don't got to denigrate the self, the body, the ego, all of it, as though God made a mistake putting us in human form. We're going right. to go back in there and weave it and work it out and bring it back in integration and be these beautifully empowered, healthily egoic beings that we were born to. Exactly. And to do that, we have to unload all this crap that was pumped into us. Right. In the form of extreme beliefs and emotions. So that's, that's the task, but you can't do that until the parts actually feel you like you care about them right. and, and feel witnessed in terms right. of what happened when they picked this stuff up in the past. I mean, every time I would explore these models, turning around my story, detaching from, you know, I, I started to feel, it wasn't just so much that I felt um, so uncomfortable about the dishonoring of myself, this, this beautiful self that had carried me through life. I also felt like I was dishonoring of my whole ancestry that mm -hmm. my booby, my grandfather, everybody who worked so hard to make me become me so I could get on with it and do a better job and have a better life than they did. All of a sudden they were all schwanzes for, uh, for do, <laughs> creating or doing all of this. What was the point of all of it? Because <laughs> nothing is real. The story isn't real. My humanness isn't real. I'm just supposed to go into the state of equanimity and float above the human fray and transcend the human experience and call that a life. And I, I mean, it gave me, I love the sense of relief it brought me at times and perspective yeah. it brought me. But after a while, I started to feel like I may as well be dead for God's sakes because I was killing everything about my selfhood. Yeah, so uh, we also agree on this idea of getting access to that unity or the non-dual. And, and from, from, from the self. Yes, that's what I'm saying. That 
and and it's pretty simple to do it. All you need to do is get your parts to open up space, and suddenly right. you're there. Because from my point of view, self is both a wave and particle, if you know what I'm talking about from mm -hmm. quantum physics, from photons. And so you can enter that wave state and enjoy it because you do have this sense of, of everything's okay when you're in it. Mm -hmm. and, and you do get a little bit less attached to what happens in this world, but then come back into your body. Right. And as you say, embody, uh, in a grounded way and be here, bring yeah. that but here. But really here, but really here. Exactly, really here. Bring that here yeah. so that you can do healing both to yourself and other people and also learn whatever you're here to learn. Don't yeah. use that to get away from here. Yeah, right. Spend your life in these other realms. That's not what we're here to do. I mean, it appears not to be. I mean, so my issue with the power of now and, and you know, even Ram Dass's work, it's so many of the whole patriarchal spiritual tradition is, I got no problem if you say, listen, I found a technique that will pull you up and out of that really painful, super neurotic material, however we language it, to give you perspective, to, you know, detach a little, give you a little bit of a breather when it's particularly traumatic. And I also have a tool for what you then do with that more expansive understanding and that vision of possibility for who you could become that happens by pulling up and out. Mm -hmm. and now I'm going to show you how to do the weave within the selfhood, this beautiful body, this temple of beingness, so that you become this bridge, what I call a Western consciousness, you know, between the quest for essence or unity consciousness fundamental to Eastern traditions mm -hmm. and the honoring of the healthy self concept fundamental to Western psychology in many ways. And you become here for all of it, a true unity consciousness. That's right. But what I would experience is when I and others would seek unity as a, in, in a way to avoid selfhood, the pains of selfhood, that the experience of unity was a completely different one and never lent itself to reintegration. Right? That's right. Yeah. And that's what you'll find also as people, as people try to do what you were trying to do before, their parts will feel more and more abandoned. Right. And we'll try harder and harder to pull them back. And, and we'll escalate in their symptoms to do that. And because uh, the stuff does, the stuff's still there. I mean, it's still the, there. You, you have, you're, just, you're just getting away from it. And, and you're simply exiling it in my language. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, what got me, I mean, I, was, I think I was always moving in this direction as a, as a matter of expression and awareness. Mm -hmm. But I had a, a connection on Facebook, somebody who had kind of abandoned her therapy practice, uh, her work with a therapist, um, and kind of bought into kind of new K, what I called new cage movement principles. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually her stuff, which was always there embodied in the cells of her being, emerged in the middle of the night and eventually hung herself. Um, mm -hmm. And then I really understood that this wasn't just a conversation about, mm -hmm. isn't it wonderful right. we can all do things in different ways, that this was a very dangerous question, issue. Right. What is spirituality? What is transformation? What is That's healing? Right. Was a life and death thing. That's why I'm happy to critically review teachings because I mm -hmm. affect millions of lives and people get led astray. And so I guess, I guess my question is for you working in psychology, you know, for somebody who's a very serious trauma survivor, who has split off into a whole number of all kinds of adaptations, disguises, and parts. What is the value of those forms of spiritual practice, or should they be avoided altogether? Um, the practices you're talking about, uh, again, if, if combined with psychology or, or, or some sort of psychotherapy, mm. could be useful. Like, I'm not against meditation per se, and actually... Mm -hmm. Me too. I, I think it can be very useful in, in a sense. My translation is, as you do it, you're showing your parts that it's safe to let you feel this mm -hmm. and, and be in this uh, everything's okay state for a while. And that gives them a little more trust in your leadership. Because mm -hmm. IFS is all about helping these parts trust you as a leader mm -hmm. rather than feeling like parentified children that have to do it for you. And so there's value in that. What, what's a little different in terms of uh, IFS-based meditation is that when you go to get there, rather than trying to ignore your thoughts and emotions or, or see them as pests, you first meet with all your parts. You, you, you ask them if they'd be willing to give you a little space for 20 minutes. 
if they don't, if they're not, if they're not up for that, then you talk to them about it. But mine now, because they trust that it's a good thing, will simply, okay, I'll give you some space. Then you're meditating. Then you come back to them with this new energy and you thank them and you embrace them. Whereas if you're trying to ignore them the whole time, Right. They'll try to bug you more and more and pull you back in. Mm-hmm. So, so it's a, it's a different way of meditating, also. Well, that's why we see such a bifurcation between you know the alleged enlightened awakened masters' presentation yeah. of reality and their personal life, right? That's because right. right, exactly. And, and you know, meditation per se doesn't heal. It can help you get through life sometimes. Mm-hmm. But it also has this downside we're talking about of, of uh, potentially exiling parts. I've been right. collaborating with some Tibetan Buddhist leaders now, I've done some workshops with a guy named Lama John McCransky and Lama Willa Miller. Uh, and they're revising everything they, they teach based on IFS. It's very exciting. Yeah, fantastic. Another guy named Reggie Ray is really into it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and so- they're. Re- they're realizing how much they've been uh, exiling parts. Yeah, dissociating, really. Yeah. I mean, so, so somatic psychotherapy, I mean, do you see, uh, identify IFS as having a somatic quality to it? Do you feel that somatic psychotherapies like uh, somatic experiencing, bioenergetics, core energetics have value and can support the work in IFS or? Yeah, very much. They're, they're very complementary. So, I've done some collaborating with Peter Levine. I'm going to do some more. Mm-hmm. My wife is a SE uh, trained person. And, cool. uh, and so when we do IFS, uh, there's a, a, a lot of emphasis on letting these parts give you a somatic sense in addition to showing you videos of what happened to them or giving you the emotions to actually move your body if they need to, mm-hmm. to let you get how bad things were when they were when all this happened to them. So, and when we have the find a part, we have you focus and find it on you, in your body, around your body. So there's a big co- somatic component to IFS. But one of the differences though is the healing, part of the healing comes from you, Jeff, witnessing what happened to the part. It, and it might involve a lot of body stuff. And so, but the, it's not a catharsis based model where full expression is the ideal. It's simply whatever the part needs to do, including moving your body for you to get it. It's a kind of get it. Finally self gets what happened to me. Right. Model. So it's like, it is about igniting awareness um, and something about that awareness, that deeper seeing allows for intrinsic transformation. Yeah, it's like any exile group in a country. What they really want is their stories to be heard. And seen. Yeah. They want to be seen for what happened to them. Mm-hmm. It's the same with these parts. They, you know, when, when you got traumatized, you had parts that wanted to forget about it and just move on, particularly if you're in the United States, because ours is a rugged individualist, just move on culture. Mm-hmm. So you wound up leaving all that, what you thought was just memory, sensations, emotions, and beliefs in the dirt, in the dust, mm-hmm. when in fact you wind up exiling the parts of you that are still frozen back there and are often the most sensitive parts of you because they're the ones who got hurt the most. Yeah. Right. And then you try to move on away from them and they're, they're hurting and feeling abandoned by you and uh, will any chance they get to try to overwhelm you. So when we, when we think about this thing called spirituality, you know, in grounded spirituality, I sort of defined it as a sort of reality that the most spiritual one is the one who's holding a connection to more realms or aspects of the human experience, which would include an embracing and connection to all their parts um, and exiles. Traditionally, it's been often defined as something that's split off from humanists again. Um, so I know you're working on a book around bringing IFS into some kind of a spiritual consciousness. How, how do you see spirituality and having to redefine itself, I guess? And, and how are you finding a bridge between IFS and what we've traditionally called spirituality? Okay. Well, so uh, 
I started out, I come from a very uh, scientific medical family where my father was a well-known medical researcher and uh, my brothers, three of them are and basically uh, atheistic, you know, Jewish culturally, but, uh, but my father kind of blamed the world's religions for a lot of the, the ale, the, the bad things about the world. And I held a lot of that coming into this work. But as I would help people get these parts to separate and this self would immediately pop up and knew how to heal them, sort of had all these what we call C words, calm, compassion, confidence, they're the eight C's of self-leadership, mm. uh, curiosity, uh, creativity, courage, clarity and connectedness mm. that nice. that would just emerge spontaneously in mm. clients, even clients that had horrible, horrible histories. Because that's perceived to be organic to us. Once we clear the debris, we come to that. Yeah, that's what I found. I mean, I didn't know that going in, yeah. but I was working as a family therapist, basically, where just like in a family, if you've got two people talking and some third person is interfering, you ask them to step back in the room and not interfere. As I was having my client talk to these parts, like let's say the cutting part I was mentioning earlier, and I'm, at this point I'm hip to the fact that the part isn't what it seems and it's good to have a better relationship with it and talk, you know, get along with it. So I'm trying to get my client to get to know it better and honor it. And suddenly my client's furious at the part. And I started to think, well, maybe that's some other part that's jumped in. Mm. So I'd say, could you find the one who's so angry at the cutting part and get it to step back in there? And my clients would say, okay, it did. And now how do you feel toward the cutting part? It would be completely different. I'm just curious about why it does this. Or even I feel sorry for it that it has to do this. Mm. And then I would say, what part of you is that? And people would say, that's not a part like these others. That's me. That's who I am. So that's why I came to call it the self with a capital S. They would say, that's myself. And as I found that in people, uh, again, with these horrible histories, uh, over and over, and ultimately concluded now, 35, 38 years later, that it's in everybody, and it can't be damaged, because I was working with people that had horrible experiences and knows how to heal. At some point, I had to shift into a more spiritual explanation for that. And there's not, I, I tried, believe me, I tried to find some kind of scientific explanation for that, that's existence, mm -hmm. and unsuccessfully. And then I got interested in different spiritual traditions and found that uh, virtually every spiritual tradition, especially con the contemplative sides of them, found the same thing and had different words for it, whether it's Atman or Buddha nature or the self or... Um, or, the, or the soul. The soul, absolutely. Or, uh, uh, you know, there's just a bunch of different words for it. So I discovered what most tr spiritual traditions already knew and almost no other psychotherapies knew. But I discovered a way to access it very quickly. You don't have to meditate 20 years to get to it. To get to the core self. Yes, to get to the self. Soul self, however we characterize exactly. it. Exactly. All it took was getting these parts to open space for it. Right, because it's, it's always right it's there. It's right there. It's, it's, right, a, it's the heart of the matter. Exactly. It's just beneath the surface mm. of these parts. Mm. So as they were willing to let it to step back, it would come out even in people with these horrible diagnoses. And then once it came out, it would start to relate to them in a way that healed them. Uh, so I just kind of followed along. And when self would come out, I would get out of the way and, and let the client, the clients would basically start doing it themselves. So that's, that was uh, incredibly, that's the big, I think my big contribution is this, I, this not idea, because it's, it's just true, that this is in everybody, and this is a way you can access it quickly, and you can help people heal themselves that way. And also, as they access more self, as you write very nicely, 
they began to heal things in the outside world too. They begin to lead their lives from this place. Right. And start to lead very different kinds of lives. You know, it's interesting. I read this, James Hillman had this term innate image that I read many years ago. And I experienced so much of my life as being a movement towards a path that was encoded in me. You know, mm-hmm. I was going to do criminal law. I was going to work with this guy at a green span. I knew it as a kid, mm-hmm. you know, and I certainly didn't grow up in an environment that encouraged or imagined we could, could become a lawyer or anything like that. This was, I would watch him on TV and go, I kind of know that guy. I feel like I'm going to work with that guy. Mm-hmm. And, and I did. Um, and it all made so much sense that I would leave mm-hmm. and study psychology and then be a writer it was all in, encoded in me. And people would say, is that the self? Is that the soul? And I, I didn't really experience them as very different. I felt that the more aligned I got with this innate image, this what I call soul scriptures, you can call it what you want, your callings. Right. Your, right. I felt like that I was really connected to and moving from my primary self. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and that so much of our work is to move all the debris and all of the unhealed parts out of the way so that we can move in a way that's aligned from the reasons that we're here this magnificent soul self that's filled with gifts and offerings and abilities and we know how often it gets unused and unutilized and underdeveloped and that's your work and my work in many ways to encourage people back in the direction of reintegrating and honoring this they get so frustrated in the so-called spiritual world when there's so much dishonoring of story and self because i feel like if i don't move in that direction i get sicker yeah. I don't get healthier. Yeah. You know? Totally agree. Yeah. But I, I think this question of what is spirituality then, you know, so mm-hmm. if somebody's living a spiritual life um, from this primary core self, I think that's a very different definitional structure than the notion of spirituality that we've been fed, which is really mm-hmm. so much about having an experience independent of the localized self. Yeah, I, I agree. And so for me, spirituality, it's, it's very spiritual just to shift your identity from the parts and their burdens to knowing this is who you are. Right. And that's what enlightenment is called in most spiritual traditions. And, and do you feel what, because you've had so much contact through this work with say the core or primary self that, you know, some of the Atman traditions w- that would still be defined as more of an absolute self. That's the same experience essentially for everyone. Like we're all going for the same field of unity. Yeah. My experience is that it's quite individuated, quite personality. And that in fact, we're not all going for the same experience of core self. We all have a profound and uniquely different self. Does that, does that make sense? It, for me, it's both. It's a, it's a, it's not an either or. So, uh, um, there is a level at which it is the same for everybody. But this, you know, particle and wave, when you come back into the particle and embody, mm. there's a lot of individuality to it that's influenced by your parts because your parts are very individualized. Mm. But, uh, but when you enter the, the, the non-dual, yeah, it's pretty much the same, I think. So it's like uh, our goal is... Uh to find that place where the uh, oceans of essence meet the individual droplet of meaning. Nicely said. Well, thank you. <laughs> Did that just come to you? Or that... I thought I'd quote from my own book. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all this amazing work you're doing in the world. It's... Oh, same with you. Yeah. I think we're kindred spirits. Yeah. I look forward to your book. I'd be happy to endorse it. If you reach the stage where you're looking for endorsements. And... Fantastic and yeah. uh, keep the conversation alive. Yeah, yeah. And yes. anything I can do to, to foster your growth and what you're up to, uh, happy to do that. Great. Thank you, Dick. You're welcome. Thank you, John.